Hello and a big warm welcome to Clock Jordan Eco Village. Thank you so much for joining us today on this virtual walk. My name is Rachel and I will be accompanying you today as we take a closer look at some of the wonderful weeds that live around us. Unwanted and unwelcome. These are the weeds, the wild plants growing in those places we try to control. Those places where we want to grow food and flowers. Those places we want to keep neat and tidy. Relentless and often prolific, they appear each year to wage battle with us. Bold, brave and sometimes downright thuggish. They invade our places. This is the story of our weeds. But like every story, is there another side? So most of the plants we're going to look at today are really common and widespread and very easily identifiable. But something that's really important to point out is that if you're planning to pick any wild plant, you need to be 200% sure that the plant that you're picking is what you think you're picking. Because whilst there's tons of amazing edible and medicinal plants out there, there are also plants that can kill you. And oftentimes those plants look really similar to something that is edible. So my suggestion is get yourself a really good field guide. Be sure, be absolutely doubly sure of what you're picking. And if possible, find somebody in your area that can actually show you and help you identify the plants. So the first plant we're going to take a look at today is nettle. Um, nettle grows all through the country. It's a really abundant weed. And the reason for that is it loves moist soil. So we have the perfect climate for nettle. Um, nettles also thrive in soil that's rich in phosphates and nitrogen. And you'll often see big clumps of nettles um, at abandoned houses where the lavatories used to be. So where will you find nettles? Well, everywhere, anywhere, but really mostly where people, where humans have been working the soil. So you'll find them in your garden, in your farmyards, at your allotments. Um, nettles, nettles grow typically to about one metre in height, although they can reach up to heights of two metres if the soil conditions are right. So let's take a closer look at a nettle. So as you can see here, the leaves are roughly heart shaped and then they're pointy at the end and they have this jagged leaf margin. And as you might notice, they get smaller and pointier as they go up the stem. The leaves sit in pairs on a square stem and probably the feature that's, that makes them most identifiable is touching them. And that's down to the hairs that cover the backs, the undersides of the leaves and the stems. There are thousands of these minute hairs which have developed on the nettle as a form of protection. So predators are very unlikely to want to eat nettles. So these little hairs, these little hairs contain silica, which makes them very brittle. And it means if you touch off the top of those, it's quite likely that the tip, the very fragile tip of the hair will actually break. And what's left behind then is a very sharp point, not too dissimilar to a hypodermic needle. The, the sharp edge then of that hair can penetrate the skin and the nettle can release a cocktail of chemicals directly into your skin. The chemistry of nettle stings isn't fully understood, but it does contain um, neurotransmitters like histamine, acetylcholine, serotonin, and also a multitude of acids, one of which is formic acid, which is the acid you would find in ant stings. So if you get stung by a nettle, it can be very, very sore. And some people can be more sensitive to the stings and the reaction can last up to a couple of days. When I was a child, we were told, if you get stung by a nettle, go find a dock leaf. Well, 
I don't know if that was just an old wives' tale, but there's another plant which we'll take a look at a little bit later, which I think is much more effective for nettle stings. So you'll see nettles start to appear in late winter, early spring. And I think this year I saw them pop up uh, around the middle of January, actually. And um, they'll continue to grow throughout the summer and very soon will start to flower. And depending on where you are in the country, the nettles that are, that are around you might already be in flower. Um, the flowers are very inconspicuous looking, tiny little white flowers that hang in tendrils or almost like catkins from both the male and the female plants. And those flowers are followed in the autumn by an abundance of seeds. Nettles have a long history of use in Ireland as a source of food, medicine, dye and fibre. Back in the time of the famine, nettle was eaten to supplement people's diets and there are reports of people's skin having been tinged green because of the amount of nettles that they were eating. Nettle fell out of favour really then as a source of food and um, I do wonder if that has something to do with the association between nettle and a very dark time in our history. As a source of food, nettle is extremely nutritious. It's jam-packed full of vitamins and minerals, particularly things like iron and potassium. And the next time you stand by some nettles, just stop, breathe and smell. Honestly, you can smell the minerals. It's quite incredible. So really, how do you incorporate nettle then into your diet? Well, any recipe that you use at home that calls for spinach, you can replace the spinach with nettle. And in fact, nettle has more iron than spinach, so Popeye didn't get it quite right. So how do you go about picking nettle? Well, if, uh, if you are unsure as to how sensitive you're going to be to their stings, I would recommend gloves. If you do find yourself out and about and you spot a few nettle leaves that you really fancy taking home and brewing up a cup of tea with, well, there's a sort of trick to picking nettles. If you treat them really delicately and gently, you'll probably get stung and break, uh, and break those hairs. But what you can do is grasp the nettle really firmly like this and what happens is the hairs actually get flattened down. So I guess that's where the expression uh, grasp the nettle came from. So it's all about being bold and going for it. Nettles have been used extensively throughout history to treat a whole variety of complaints from arthritis to gout to kidney stones to allergies. A cup of nettle tea in the season prior to uh, hay fever season is really useful. Um, and all you do is simply pick a few leaves, add boiling water, let it brew for 15 or 20 minutes, sit back and enjoy. Um, there was a very funny practice, and it is still practiced in some places, called urtication, uh, that people would use for arthritis. And that would involve picking nettle stems and then, and then literally whacking the arthritic joints with the nettles. It was said to relieve pain and also inflammation. Now, I'm not too sure if it was just causing a different type of pain to take your mind off the pain of the arthritis. Nettle is one of our most important native plants for wildlife and supports more than 40 types of insects through providing food and a safe habitat. Sap-loving aphids swarm to nettles and they in turn provide food for other insects such as ladybirds. And a nettle leaf is actually where a ladybird prefers to lay its eggs. Nettles are also key to the survival of many of our most colourful butterflies, as they are the primary food source for many caterpillars, including those of the red admiral, tortoise shell and peacock. So as you'll notice, uh, most of the nettle leaves, the tips are quite open. If you spot leaves that are closed in on themselves, be really, really, really careful because I suspect somebody's in here having a nutritious lunch. Let's take a look. So this caterpillar has literally 
curls the leaves of the nettle in on top of himself and has created what is almost like a suit of armour made out of nettle rather than out of metal. As I mentioned earlier, later in the season, the nettle flowers are replaced by seeds. The seeds help the nettle to reproduce along with its uh, extensive root system. But the seeds also provide a really important source of food for our birds that love to eat seeds. Not only are they good for the birds, they're good for us too. This is a true superfood and really worthwhile exploring if you get a chance. So here we are at this beautiful old stone wall. And this is actually the preferred habitat of the next plant that we're gonna take a look at. This, this is navelwort. It loves growing in crevices and cracks on old stone walls. You'll often find it too, growing at the bottom of trees and on cliffs. It's a, it's a member of the same family that includes succulents. And succulents tend to have thick leaves and they have the ability then to store water. So if you can come in a little bit closer, you'll see that the, uh, the leaves are roughly round and they have these like scalloped edges. And if we can take a look at the back side of the leaf, we'll see that the stem is attached to the back of the leaf exactly where there's this indentation or this dimple on the front of the leaf. And that's where it's gotten its name because it looks very like an innie belly button. And uh, the Latin name for this is umbilicus rupestris and rupestris means wall. So navelwort is native. It's a short-lived perennial and you'll see here now it's starting to flower. So the flowering season is from May to September and the flowers will, will grow up to about 25 centimeters in height. They are cream-shaped um, little bells and it's very easy not to spot them. So the next time you're going past an old wall, stop and take a look and see if you can see some of this navelwort. Um, <clears throat> these leaves are edible. Uh, they taste very mild and you can, you can use them uh, to replace cucumber, you can uh, stir fry them or you can simply chop them up and put them into your salad for that extra little bit of crunchiness. Now, when the, flower, when the flowers um, start appearing, the leaves, as we can see here, do tend to wither. But later on in the year, in late autumn and early winter, we will actually have a second flush of the leaves. So not only is navelwort edible, it's also a medicinal plant and there is extensive uh, records of it being used in Ireland and across Europe to treat all sorts of things from wounds to boils to corns, even to epilepsy. But what I really like to use navelwort for is minor burns and I'll show you exactly how I do that. So what you want to do is to pick a nice, let me see now, a nice uh, thick leaf. There's one here. Be very, very, very careful when you are picking navelwort um, because the root system is really shallow. So it would be very easy to pull the entire plants off the wall. So what you want to do is just to hold onto the stem and then pinch the leaf off like that. Like with every other plant, be really careful when you're harvesting and make sure that you only pick when there is an abundance of the plant. And certainly with, um, with navelwort, if I was going to pick some of this for a salad, for example, I would only pick one or two leaves from each of these rosettes. So what you want to do with the, with the navelwort is to very gently peel the skin off the underside of the leaf, like so, and like so, and like so. And what you might be able to see there is like a gel-like sap. 
And when you rub that onto the burn or the inflamed skin, it's really cooling. So this is like Irish aloe vera. So the next plant we're going to look at is a member of the Plantago family. Uh, it's called plantain. Now there's four or five different types of plantains living in Ireland. You'll often so see them exactly where we are at the side of the road. Um, uh, you'll see them in your garden, on wasteland. They're actually one of the most widespread weeds we have here in Ireland, but they often go quite unnoticed. I mean, they're rather unassuming. And if you take a look at the flowers, I mean, they're not that noticeable. So plantains um, typically will grow in, in clumps and the leaves will form a rosette. This, um, this plantain is ribwort plantain or plantain lancelotta is the botanical name. So you can see that the leaves are somewhat shaped like lances. And then they have these deep ribs which run from the bottom of the leaf to the top. We then have a furrowed stem from which we have then the flower or the seed head protruding. Now, actually we might find a slightly better example, but the flowers will stand up, their little yellow, the stamens will stand up in what is almost like a halo. So if we can see some examples of that here. Yes, here we go. Now those flowers have started to dry out, but when you look from above, it's, uh, it's quite a sight. So pollen records will tell us that plantain has been in Ireland for over 5,000 years. And um, <clears throat> the Irish word for plantain is slán lus, slán from slánta, uh, which means healthy, and lus, which means herb or plant. So the Irish word for this is the health plant. And indeed, plantain has been used extensively throughout Ireland and Europe for its medicinal properties. The leaves are antibacterial, they have antihistamine properties, and they're anti-inflammatory. Um, travelers in olden days used to often pick a leaf and stick it into the soles of their shoes to help aching feet on their travels. If I was to get stung by an insect or indeed a nettle when I was out and about in the uh, great outdoors, this is the plant I would be looking for, not the dock. So how you would use plantain out in the wild is find, is find a nice leaf. Make sure whenever you're picking any leaves or flowers out in the wild, that you're not picking them from an, a polluted area or anywhere where a dog might have um, uh, done its business. So pick the plantain leaf and then there's a couple of ways of extracting the medicine. The easiest way is to take the leaf and to literally roll it in your hands like this. So what you're trying to do is to extract the, the juice, the sap inside the leaves and then simply apply this to the bite or the burn. Another thing you can do, which I would do if I wasn't on camera, is to pick a leaf, pop it in my mouth, chew it, and do exactly the same thing. And there's another amazing thing you can do with plantain leaf, if you have been cut, is again, pick a leaf, like this, and then just using, I'm just using my nail here, I'm gonna make a little slit in the middle of the leaf. And then I'm going to pop the stem in like this and voila, I have a plaster. Isn't it wonderful? So also there's uh, records of plantain being used for coughs in the, so that was in the form of a tea. And, and it's very, very easy to make plant tea, plantain tea. Just pick a couple of leaves, chop them up, pop them into your cup, add some boiling water, and it makes a beautiful soothing tea. It's really nice on, for the digestive tract. Um, plantain is also edible and is full of vitamins and minerals and is very high in vitamin K. The way you would eat plantain is simply pick a couple of leaves, chop them up and add them into your salads. 
But the most crazy thing about plantain is actually, in terms of edibility, is this little seed head. So, you can see this is a young one and it hasn't flowered yet. So if you pick one of these, when, the next time you're out in the wild, rub it between your hands to release all the oils and the, the aroma. And it smells like mushrooms. Unbelievable. And you can make a really delicious side dish by frying these up in a little garlic and butter. Or you can make, um, you can make uh, mushroom stock. Now, do you remember, whenever you're picking plants in the wilds, these are tomorrow's plants, so go easy. So plantain is another really important plant for our wildlife. Each of these little flowers has tons of really yummy nectar that is loved by our bumblebees, hoverflies, moths, butterflies, and as you can see, these ones, it has quite a long season, actually, I meant to say. So these seed heads will last into the winter, but these seeds here make delicious foods for birds that love to eat seeds. So this is a great plant to have around for the wildlife. So the next plant we're gonna look at a little bit closer is horsetail. Horsetail is native to Ireland and it is an ancient plant. These are descendants from plants that lived over 340 million years ago in the Carboniferous period. They grow everywhere and anywhere. They need very little nutrition and they have a very extensive root system that goes both horizontally and vertically into the earth. The vertical roots can reach down to almost two meters. And it is this extensive root system that allows them to pull minerals up from the earth, notably silica. So what we're looking at here are the very first stems because there's two stages to horsetail growth. And these are the first stems that will appear in springtime. These, these brown hollow stems have this cone shape on top, and this contains up to 100,000 spores. So horsetail will reproduce not just through its roots, but also through these spores. These are non-photosynthetic and they're edible. So if you can take a look inside, I don't know if you can see this, but the stems are actually hollow. And at each of these nodes, did you see that liquid, like water? So if you find yourself out in the fields feeling a little thirsty and you want to nibble on something, it's perfectly fine to have a nibble on these. So, these are, the, uh, these are the second stems um, that horsetail uh, shoots up. You can see that the, um, the earlier spring stems, the fertile stems, have actually died back. And the only purpose these have is actually to photosynthesize and to produce food for the plant. Um, horsetail has been used medicinally for years, uh, primarily because of its really high silica content. And if you feel these leaves, they're actually very abrasive. And um, this plant will actually grow up to maybe like so high and has a sort of conifer-like appearance. Um, in many preparations now for skin, hair or nails, you'll find horsetail as one of the ingredients. And it's actually this part of the plant that's used. It's normally the top tip of the, uh, the second growth, the, these stems. Um, <clears throat> uh, a very interesting um, uh, thing actually was years and years and years ago, back in the day of the knights, they used to use horsetail to polish their suits of armor. Um, uh, a very good thing you can do with silica at home is you can make tea. So you can just pluck off the top of the stems like so. You can dry them and then you can make uh, tea which you can drink 
which is very good for your skin, hair and nails, but it's also, it can make a really nice gargle for sore throats. Um, I've used uh, the tips of the horsetail as a lovely hair rinse as well. So what you would do is pick a cupful of the tips, put them into a pot with maybe six uh, cups of water, boil it up for, I don't know, 30 minutes, let it cool, strain out the plant material and then use the liquid to tip over your hair and it makes your hair lovely and shiny. It's really, really, really good feed for it. Um, I don't have any roses in my garden, but apparently too, a, a tea of um, horsetail is very good for getting rid of the dreaded black spot on, uh, on roses. <laughs> I think those knights back in the day must have had a lot of time. Anyhow, you can see, you can see that this copper pot or jug is actually cleaning up. It's so abrasive, my goodness. Voila. Your very own scouring pad. The last weed that we're going to look at today is probably one of the most widely recognized plants in the world. And some would argue is the most successful plant on this planet. It's dandelion. So if we take a closer look at the leaves, the leaves have inspired the common name, dandelion, which means don de lion, and excuse the French accent. So these serrated leaves look quite like lion's tooth. The leaves grow in a, in a rosette, and then from the leaves, we have these hollow stems and the bright, cheerful yellow flowers that we're all so familiar with. This is the first wild plant or weed I think all children learn to recognize. And interestingly, this is not one flower, rather it's comprised of hundreds of individual little florets, all of which produce nectar, pollen, and their own seed. When the dandelion flowers fade away, they're quickly replaced with these downy globes uh, which contain the seeds. And there's hundreds of seeds in there that are dispersed by the wind, as we can see here, and by children. When I was small, we used to play, uh, we used to play a game with dandelions where we were puffing on the dandelions and the number of puffs it took to remove all of the seeds would tell you the time. So we used to call these dandelion clocks. Dandelions are one of the most important plants that are used throughout the world for medicine. And they are what herbalists would describe as perfect plant medicine, because every part of the dandelion can be used medicinally. The flower heads have been used as a gentle analgesic and um, the leaves are a powerful diuretic. And the French common name for dandelion isn't Don de Lyon, it's actually Pissonli, which means pissy bed, which refers to this diuretic property. The roots of the dandelions are used to treat liver and gallbladder complaints. And my very first introduction to plant medicine was as a child, when my grandmother showed me the sap, the milky sap. I don't know if you can see this. That's inside the dandelion head. So you would just rub that on warts or verrucas and they would magically disappear. Dandelions are edible. Every part of them other than the stalk you can eat. So starting with the flower head, um, you can make a really nice syrup with this, uh, which tastes almost honey-like. Also the individual florets can be added to salad 
Um, and you can add these also to cooked rice to give it a lovely floral taste. The leaves, full of vitamins and minerals, really high in iron, and they have a bitter taste. And you know, it's a funny thing, but over the last while, we've totally lost that, that, that taste, the bitter taste in our diets. So we now primarily eat salty or sweet. It's very good for our bodies to introduce some bitter. So all you need is a young dandelion leaf, before it's flowered. I mean, we are late in the season here, but I felt this was such an important plant we needed to include it today. So what I would do is take one leaf, chop it up finely and add it to a salad. It is bitter, you don't need any more than that. And that would be enough to feed four people. So the roots, the roots can be dug up in the autumn time. That's when they're at their best. Um, so you literally dig the root up, you clean it, chop it up, roast it in the oven for about 30 minutes, and then you can grind those roots up to make a delicious beverage. I mean, some people call it dandelion, like a coffee substitute. I think that's a misnomer. It tastes nothing like coffee, but it's a really healthful drink. And I'll show you here some dandelion root that I cut and roasted up last year. This was a very popular beverage uh, and there used to be, people used to grow crops of dandelion to produce this. So the dandelion's peak flowering time is probably late March to May, to early May. And that coincides with the time when the bees and other pollinators are emerging from hibernation. As we said earlier, each of these flowers is actually a separate flower in itself, a little floret, and each one packed with nectar and pollen. And this easy, easily accessible and available source of food is a lifesaver for pollinators in the springtime. Bumblebees, solitary bees and honeybees all visit dandelions for food, uh, along with hoverflies, beetles and butterflies. And those seeds, they make a delicious snack as well for goldfinches and house sparrows. Thanks so much for tuning in today and I do hope you've enjoyed this short walk. I hope too tomorrow when you step outside into your gardens, into your driveways, into your streets, into your places, that you will look with a little wonder at those wild plants, those weeds that are growing all around you. These weeds, they contain wisdom and an age old wisdom that we have become so disconnected from. They provide us with food, medicines, and a vital, ever so vital support for our biodiversity. Sometimes it's all about hearing the other side of the story.